as we open your word today, we don't speak into a void. There are people who come from all kinds of situations that are not evident to us. And we skip through the halls of this sacred place like children skipping through Walmart without stopping to consider what might be going on that we cannot see, what we don't understand, and so we don't pay attention to. Help us today, Lord, to pay attention to your word and hear your voice, not the voice of a mere sinful human being. We ask this for the sake of your people and may your name in the process get glory. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, as we look at uh, Proverbs 18, 14. much but people coming from all kinds of directions in life that we don't see and we don't necessarily have a sensitivity for and I don't think we would would have or ever would have if the Spirit of God did not wake us up from time to time but I want to look at it and then I just want to, I wish I could, I wish I could talk to you from my heart, but that's not good enough. I wish that God could speak to your heart through mine. That's what we're supposed to do when we come together, but we don't do that because we put on our Sunday face, and I hate that. You know, we're supposed to be joyful, a joyful heart. It's good medicine, Proverbs 17, 22, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. I just wonder, how many people with dry bones come into this place each week in almost desperation? Who was it, Emerson, that said most people live lives of quiet desperation? I don't know, somebody said that. But we got to have a smile. I'm joyful today. I am happy, happy, happy. I remember I was uh, I was in, I was still an undergrad. I had to, had to completely reorient my educational life after after the Marine Corps. And so I was in undergrad, and, and part of our undergrad thing was we were going to do an evangelistic service. You know, this was these were the senior theology students. We we're going to we're going to go out and save the world. And I remember this one guy, I was feeling particularly bummed. I was older than most of them and had been places they would never could have imagined. And this guy was going, he signed to me, and I wanted to sign back to him, but not in that particular way. And, of course, my wife was there and kicked me, so I didn't do it. Had she not been there, I probably would have. That would have been the end of my evangelism. But, you know, as Christians, we're not supposed to be bummed out. And this, this word, crushed spirit, it's, it's naka, is to strike, to scourge, or to be stricken, utterly stricken. I guess if I could put it in 20th century terms, I would say beat down. At work, you know, we see guys, young guys coming up, you know, and they, maybe they get a promotion, and they're in there, they're not, they're no longer operators, now they're in management, and, and they're going to go out and they're going to fix things. We're going to do it right from now on. We're going to do it right. And within six months, they're beat down. 
that's that's a very graphic picture to me. I don't know how that how you process that. But life beats us down. And there's all kinds of things that do that to us. It could be betrayal professionally, it could be betrayal in our personal life. It could be tragedy in our personal life. It could be loss. I mean, there are some kinds of grief. It's not a question of when you go through this grief of loss, it's not optional. <laughs> You're in it. You're in this ocean of grief, and the waves take you. You don't resist the waves because you can't. And no matter what your thoughts, conscious thoughts might be, this, some, this thing is bigger than you are, and you wonder where you're going to wind up. And I don't know, I suspect most of y'all could relate to that in some way or another. It could, be, it could be because of something that you have done or have not done. It could be of some sin in your life that you just can't quite shake. And you know that what you do is wrong. And you know that it grieves God and you just don't see how he could possibly countenance your presence anymore I don't know uh, that's called besetting sins those are the kinds of sins that we just kind of recur in our lives and we just can't seem to get rid of them and of course we're Christians so we're not supposed to have sin in our lives I don't know about you but I do and let me just tell you this to start, I'm just going to save it for the last, but I want to just say this up front. If you want to come close to God, you want to come closer to the Lord Jesus Christ, and you want to walk with him, and you truly want to walk with him, and not just strut around in church to be seen, you're going to see things about yourself that are true, that you wish you hadn't seen. And you know, a gracious God, a gracious Holy Spirit never shows us all that's in our heart. Because if we saw everything that he sees, we would be overcome. We couldn't handle it. I don't think we could lift our head. You know, you, you, you read biographies of people like, uh, I can't think of his, Dwight L. Moody. You know, he, he walks around in Chicago for, for months. He says, the hand of the Lord was heavy upon me. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, he was probably seeing things about his ministry and about his, his own heart they hadn't seen before. And that's, that's a good thing. Because now you're beginning to learn something that's true about yourself that you didn't know before. And you can repent. Because God wouldn't show it to you if he wasn't providing a solution for you. And just because you see it doesn't mean you won't stumble in the future. We stumble through this life. We don't march. We like to think of ourselves marching to Zion, but we're stumbling pretty much. And just about the time you think you've got it wired, about the time you think that you've got all your ducks in a row, you see there's a whole other ridge that you haven't even seen before. And there it is. You're headed that away. <laughs> That's our life. That's life. That's life. How many of us sitting here right now are within the sound of my voice are crushed? Joy, joy, joy. I'm happy this morning because I'm in church. And God forbid that I should ever, how are you doing? I'm just fine. I'm just wonderful today. I'm bleeding inside, but I'm wonderful today because I'm in church. And the minute I step out of that parking lot and get in my vehicle and go to wherever I'm going, I'm crushed again and I'm still bleeding. That's, that's, I wish there was some way we could take that down. I wish there was some way we could take that down. But this is, there's many places in the Old Testament. Let me preach a little bit here about the Old Testament. We need the Old Testament. We cannot rightly understand the New Testament because those people that were, when, when Paul said, you know, the scripture's divinely inspired and good for reproof and instruction, he wasn't talking about the New Testament because it hadn't been written yet. 
was talking about the Old Testament. But there's so many things in there that just are opaque to us. They don't, they don't make a lot of sense. And so, you know, I used to ask the pastor or my Sunday school teacher, and they would just give me this blank look and say, well, you know, just, just pray more and study your Bible, you know, and God will show you the way. Which was another way of saying, I don't know either. But more things have been revealed in the past 40 or 50 years. Actually, since, since, since I was studying as a young man, that I never suspected there's a lot that God has, has shown his people. A lot of breadcrumbs there that are giving us a path to follow from the New Testament back into the Old Testament. You can't understand the book of Revelation without understanding Ezekiel, without understanding Daniel, without understanding, and understanding, at least be conversant with it, so that when you see the words, your mind automatically goes back to it. So, okay, let's get back on track here. That word, naka, is the same word that is used when it, when it says, in Proverbs 15, a glad heart makes a cheerful face, but by sorrow of heart, the spirit is crushed. Same word, same word. Same idea of, of someone being smitten or scourged, but not to death, not quite to death. You know, just, just beat up, and then you put the mouth on the side of the curb and stomp on the guy's back of his head, you know, just to finish him off good. That's nakha, crushed severely. Being sick, ah, sickness was not necessarily a bad thing when I was a little kid. Because in those days, back in the old days, uh, mothers, pretty much most of the mothers were at home. And uh, I got to sit up on the couch and drink 7-Up. Uh, we didn't get soda water all the time. Got 7-Up, maybe even Coca-Cola, and eat chicken noodle soup and watch Captain Kangaroo or Tom Terrific. Some of those things. If you can relate to those, you're, you're really old. Okay. So, Isaiah 16, 17. This is just another use of that word, nakha, and it's a prophecy against Moab. Therefore, let Moab wail for Moab. Let everyone wail, mourn, utterly stricken for the raisin cakes of Kir Haraset. Utterly stricken. So, okay, we got there. Now, how does God see us when we're in that condition? Psalm 34, 18. The Lord Yahweh is close to the brokenhearted and save those who are crushed in spirit. And, of course, one of the texts that immediately come to my mind is Psalm 51. David, it's a different word, but a similar idea that Psalm 51, 17, this is a psalm that he wrote after his affair with Bathsheba and the murder that he committed against her husband and the lust that was in his heart that led him there in the first place. You know, there was no sacrifice for adultery. When you're caught in adultery, you read Leviticus, it's death. You know, murder death. There was no sacrifice for that. Well, how come David wasn't killed? Well, it says in 2 Samuel 12, 13, David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord has put away your sin. You shall not die. God reached down in his sovereignty. I guess he had to go through the New Testament all the way back to David to not have to kill him. I don't know. But look what it says. The sacrifices of God, not the sacrifices of, of Leviticus, because there are no sacrifices for sin per se. If you read Leviticus, I'm sure you've all read Leviticus several times, uh, those sacrifices were 
in order to enable sinful people, the priests primarily, to enter sacred space. And only certain priests, you know, there was a gradation of sacred space. The people could go to the courtyard, but they could only go so far, and the priests could go to the altar, and then beyond the altar was the holy place, and the priests could go in there only for certain things, and then the most holy place, and only the high priest could go in there, and only once a year. So there's these gradations. And so to protect, you know, the sacrifices weren't to protect the people, it was to protect sacred space. This, this is sacred place, space. This is sacred space. Because the Shekinah glory is not in the most holy place. It's in you and in me. And when we come together, we are in sacred space. We ought to act like it. We ought to teach our children to act like it. Because this is God. Who is God? He is Yahweh. He is holy. He is most holy. So there is no sacrifice there in Leviticus for sins. The sin offering is to cleanse the unclean so that they can approach. Because if you'll remember in Genesis and in, especially in Exodus, when they come to the mountain of God, God says, hey, you can only come so close. And then only the elders could go up the mountain a certain distance and they could see God from a distance, but only Aaron and Moses could go up. Even Joshua had to stay back. You see, there's still a gradation going up that mountain. Okay, I better get off that rabbit trail. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. That, that word is more like a sorrowful spirit. It's not nakah. It's a, it's a different word. But it's the same idea. There are, there are people, because, because, you know, I hate to tell you all this, if you don't already know it, you know, we are not alone. And we have never been alone. This world is inhabited by other beings supernaturally that we can't see. Well, I don't know. Some people might can. I don't know. <laughs> Most of them are locked up, though. I just wonder sometimes just how crazy they really are. Or maybe they just, what they see is actually true. I don't know. But I do know that the Bible is a supernatural book, and it teaches about a supernatural world, and we live in it. There are principalities and powers. There are angelic beings, and there are demonic beings. And our lives are impacted by them in ways we don't understand. And I don't think it was God's purpose for us to make a handbook of exorcism, you know. And that's a, that's a whole other study, but, but it's, a, it's a fact. And so what causes... What causes crushing spirit? What causes things to happen? And so I went out on a limb. I mean, what other thing do you think of when you think of a crushed spirit? What do you think of in Scripture? What comes to mind? Who? Come on. I can hear you. You talk loud. Job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You reckon he would be crushed? I mean... You know, and people, people have a problem with that because they're saying, you oh, know, God's up here, God's up here, you know, rolling dice with Job's life. No, he's not rolling dice. God knows. And there was a reason why he put Job to that test, but Job didn't understand it. And all these things happened to him. And I want to take time to, to look at a few chapters in Job. I think in scripture of all the crushed spirits and here's one of the problems I think that we have in the church still we'd probably like to think that we wouldn't but now think about what comes into your mind and into my mind when we see these people out here 
standing on the corner with a sign. You know, I mean, we don't know exactly what brought them to that place. You know, so, you know, we're living in a time when everybody's a victim. Everybody's a victim. And I think of myself as a victim. I'm just a hapless victim, and it's because, you know, and, and of course, as, as reformed people, we, we, we stand in our smug, reformed place and say, well, you know, they're reprobate. You know, it's, it, was, it was in the cards, you know. Well, I got news for you. We may be reformed, but your choices matter. They matter in this life, and they matter to God. We are his imagers, and we choose. We make choices. We go left and not right. We go forward or backwards based many times on choices. Not always. Not always. It wasn't so in Job's life. But, but we don't know. You know, but when I see these people, I'm thinking, yeah, you know, probably what, what happened? You know, drugs, alcohol, you know, uh, lost your wife, lost your job, you know, and now you're a victim, you know. Uh, I can tell you that a lot of the things that have happened in my life is because of bad choices I made. And that's one of the things that we need to come to when we approach God's presence, truth, he knows the truth. So don't be coming up with some kind of mangy excuse. You know, I, my mommy put me on the potty backwards when I was a kid, and I haven't been the same since. Yeah, I've got to tell you this story. I've got to tell you this story. i got an uncle. I had an uncle who was, he was a lawyer. He became a judge in East Texas. This is East Texas, deep East Texas. Anyway, whenever, whenever, he, whenever he would lose something, and I was visiting, whenever he would lose something, everybody had to stop what they were doing and look for that. Well, he lost his watch, couldn't find his watch, and we were all hunting for it. Where in the, I don't even, you know. And so I'm, I'm looking around, finally I, I go up to him and I say, Uncle Tiny, I don't know where to look. Where, where should I? He said, in the commode. I went in the bathroom, and I was looking in the commode. And I remember, I'll never forget him standing there looking at me and the look on his face. This has got to be the dumbest kid that ever lived. <laughs> yeah, I was looking for it in the commode. He said to do it. I don't know, I don't know why I told you that. <laughs> anyway. Uh, but... But in Job's case, you know, he didn't know. And, and, and we don't know about these people. Sometimes it's, it's a way of life. You know, I used to work at the Texas Employment Commission back when they called it that. And we had, we had in the wintertime, there was starting in the fall, you know, the, the transients would start coming down from the cold states. They were going to Corpus or they were going to the valley or they were going wherever because it's cold up there and it's less cold where it used to be less cold down here and then they would go back sometimes you know you would actually get to know them and uh, it was a way of life there were programs that would help them get out of that lifestyle but you know you know when you're when you're like that all you need to know is where the next quart of beer and the next pack of cigarettes was coming not so much food they knew where to get food but if I can scrounge enough money to get a quart of beer and a pack of cigarettes, I'm good for the day. That's pretty uncomplicated. I'm not saying they enjoyed that lifestyle. I'm simply saying that was a part of the, that was a part of the scenario. I don't know how many of you can remember the, the people lined up on the outside looking for day labor. Well, I was the guy that went in an hour early to open up with those guys and shake up these numbers, and they pull a number, and then I'd write their name down, and as the calls came in for day labor, I'd send them out. If they had transportation, sometimes people would come and pick them up. But after about 10 o'clock, the calls quit coming in, and they'd sit in the back and read the newspaper and talk politics. And I got to know some of them, you know, some of them, you know. But they, they, when they did away with the day labor pool, most of those guys had part-time jobs within about five days. So... 
it's others others genuinely had issues in their lives that they, they they've just given up on so anyway we don't always know where these people are coming from and I guess I wish that I could stop judging people but we do that I do that and sometimes the Lord will say stop give them some money and if I have some on me I give them you know and, and my wife says, oh, just spend it on drugs. Well, okay. Then, you know, so, okay, that's not my problem. Anyway, uh, we, we have that around us. We have that around us. But I'm just saying, hey, you know what? It's, it's, it's in here too. Not, not those issues, but heart issues. Heart issues. Crushed spirits. So the thing that amazes me about Job, if you, if you read chapter 15, you got Eliphaz, and here's what we do. We, we tend to say, well, you know, it's, it's something that you did caused this. You know, uh, you've sinned in your life. There's sin in your life. You know, you're aching. You've got the hidden, the hidden gold from Babylon, Babylonian gold in your tent somewhere, and you're causing sin in your life, and that's what's causing all these problems. We have a tendency to do that. Sometimes even about our own self. You know, I lost my daughter in 2006. And the suggestion has come to me more than once. You know, if you had only, if you had just, and I'll tell you what, the days and weeks and months after that, when we think, okay, it's, it's enough, the waves were still coming. The waves were still coming. And I'd listen to Emmy Lou Harris sing Boulder to Birmingham and cry all the way home every day. And it wasn't. It wasn't because I was just being emotional. But it did reach a point where the waves were less and less. They still come around once or twice a year. But the, the thought, if, if I would have only done something, well, now, that's not God telling me that. Somebody else likes to tell me that. Or if you'd only done this, or if you'd only done that, or if she would have just not said, you know, I'm sure in your marriages you don't have that kind of thing. So this is Eliphaz the Temanite. And I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'll skip around a little bit. But it's, it's, it's the chapter where Eliphaz is obviously angry at Job because he's essentially saying, that's enough, enough, Job. You need to snap out of this and, and, and acknowledge what the problem is. You know, and remember, Job lost all of his possessions, he lost all of his children, earthquake destroyed his houses, all of his cattle and livestock were gone, so he's penniless, and then he's stricken with boils from the sole of his foot to the top of his head, and he's sitting there scraping his boils with broken pieces of pottery. And his friends come, and the smartest things his three friends did was shut up and listen for a week. You know, because when we are crushed in spirit, even as Christians, we will think things and sometimes when we think it's safe, say things or things will just come out that you don't really mean. Or just it's just it's just emotion. But we need to allow each other to do that. And not go, oh, how could you say such a thing? I remember being in a Bible study in all places, of all places, California, where we were sitting around in a circle, and it was, I was the only guy there besides the pastor. And all the women were going around talking about how much they loved Jesus. Oh, yes, I love Jesus so much. And then the next one would go on how she loved Jesus. And I got upset. It just something rose up in me, and I said, you know, when it got my turn, I said, you know, I, I wish I loved Jesus. I'd like to love Jesus, but the truth of the matter is I don't love him nearly enough, or as much as y'all are saying. Oh. And the pastor looked at me and just smiled, it, because that was a moment of truth for me. 
That was a moment, if I really loved Jesus, it would impact the things that I do, the things that I say, the places I go, the people I hang out with, the people I don't hang out with. And I'm still a mixed bag at 75, so there you go. So Eliphaz, the Temanite, says, should a wise man answer with windy knowledge and fill his belly with the east wind? Should he argue in unprofitable talk or in words with which he can do no good? And you know, if you read the stuff that his friends are saying to him, I can relate. I can go, yeah, yeah, that's right. And, you know, you go on down, verse 15, because, this is interesting. Verse 14, what is man that he can be pure? Or who is born of a woman that he can be righteous? Well, there's one. There's one. Behold, God puts no trust in his holy ones. He didn't even trust the heavenly host. Because they have the ability to choose too. That's why we have demons. We won't go down that rabbit trail, although I wish I could. And the heavens are not pure in his eyes, how much less one who is abominable and corrupt, a man who drinks injustice like water. You know, I could agree to that. You know, we, we, we believe in original sin, and sometimes it gets pretty, pretty graphic. I mean, hello, we can't even decide which gender we are. The wicked man writhes in pain all his day, verse 20. You know, he's taking a shot at Job, who's sitting there full of boils, through all the years that are laid up for the ruthless. Dreadful sounds are in his ear. In prosperity, the, in prosperity, the destroyer will come upon him. Yeah, you know, you're a used car salesman, and guess what? You know, it came on you, and I knew it would get to you sooner or later. God's going to get you. Okay, but we've got Psalms that say things like, you know, how come the, the wicked prosper? They're doing good. There's plenty of fat on them. People were not fat in those days unless they were rich. Verse 27, because he has covered his face with his fat and gathered fat about his waist and has lived in desolate cities. Desolate cities. You know, he's taken a shot at Job's houses that were, that were, that the earthquake got. And houses that none should inhabit, which were ready to become heaps and ruins. He will not be rich, and his wealth will not endure. No, he's just saying, hey, dude, you brought this on yourself by some hidden sin that you're not telling us about, and God knows about it, and he's going to get you. God's going to get you for that. Remember? He will not depart from darkness. The flame will dry up his shoots. Now he's taking a shot at him losing his children. By the breath of his mouth, he will depart, and on and on. You know, and Job comes back in verse 16, in chapter 16. I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but it's, you know, my face is red with weeping, verse 16, and on my eyelids is deep darkness. Although there is no violence in my hands and my prayer is pure, I haven't done anything. I'm not guilty. O earth, cover not my blood. That's like Abel. He's saying, you know, let, let the blood of my body call out to God like Abel's did. And let my cry find no resting place. Even now, behold, my witness is in heaven. Now, this is amazing. Even now, behold, my witness is in heaven. And he who testifies for me is on high. Well, what is he talking about? My friends scorn me. My eye pours out tears to God that he would argue the case of a man with God. That my eye pours out tears to God that he would argue the case of a man with God. This is the oldest book in the Bible. As a son of man does with his neighbor. For when a few years have come, I shall go the way from which I shall not return. My spirit is broken. My days are extinct. The graveyard is ready for me. Surely there are markers about, mockers about me, and my eye dwells on, the, on their provocation. He, he's got a death wish. 
How many of y'all, and you don't have to raise your hand, how many of y'all have sometimes wished that you could just go on and be with the Lord and be out of here? You know, I have a friend at work, one of my closest friends. I've known him for 31 years now. And he lost, his, his dad died in his 60s, his mother from cancer a couple of years later. And he, he's always talking about, I'm, I'm getting on the bus before you do. I say, hey, that ain't happening, Junior Asparagus, because you're about 15 years younger than me. I'm getting on the bus first. And that's the only thing I can think of to say to ameliorate this death wish he has, you know? I mean, in the summertime, you talk about, you know, we have a, a heat thing. You know, when it gets so hot and, and the adjusted temperature reaches a certain point, we're supposed to take a certain break. Every, not that guy. You know, I can't, if, if, I, if I chase him down, he runs someplace else. It's like he's got a death wish. But look at this. Look at this that Job, and truly, his whole life is in ruins. In chapter 19, verse 25, this is probably my favorite verse. You know, he's, he's been talking with his comforting friends who are opening their heart to him, and their hearts are very hard. He says in verse 24, Oh, that with an iron pen and lead they were engraved in the rock forever, that my words were written that they were inscribed in a book. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth. A Redeemer, Goel. The Goel is the kinsman Redeemer, one that's related, you know, the kinsman Redeemer. He will stand upon the earth, and after my skin has thus been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, and I shall see for myself my eyes shall be whole and not another. How, how did this guy get this? This is the oldest book of the Bible. So in the end, what amazes me about this book, one of the other things that amazes me is that, that, that it, you know, the, the back and forth goes on and the arguing back and forth. And, you know, Job asked what I think are some pretty good questions, Yahweh. What do you got to say? And he doesn't say anything. He just comes and begins to talk to Job and said, look, what, what, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? And, and look, what about Leviathan? What about the great Tehom, the deep? You know anything about the deep? Can you put a hook in there and draw him up? And of course, there's nothing he can say. But in the end, he is satisfied in his heart. He is satisfied. And he said, you know, I had spoke without knowledge by the hearing of the ears, but now my eyes have seen. Therefore, I put my hand on my, over my mouth and I repent myself in dust and ashes. I wonder what he saw. You know, I'd like to be able to say that. I'd like to be able to say, you know, all of the things that have happened in my life and in the lives of people that I know that I don't have an explanation for, they're not important anymore. Just you. Just you. And I worship at your feet, and you have the right to do anything with me. And so, in the very end, this is what, this is what God says. After, this is verse, chapter 42, verse 7. After the Lord had spoken these words to Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, the Temanite, the guy that was taking these cheap shots at him when he was really down, my anger burns against you and against your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. In all that Job said, in all the death wish, and all of the complaining and whining that he did, he did not reject God. He did not turn on God. He just complained loudly. You know, God's a big boy. He can handle it. If that's what's on your heart, you need to tell him. 
because he already knows it. But it helps. He wants a relationship with us, not just about the wonderful joy, joy, joy that's down in my heart, but about everything. The things you struggle against and can't seem to get on top of. The things that are hurting you and your family. Even the things that are hurting our nation. He knows about that too. And he cares, but he starts with you. Now therefore take seven bulls and seven rams. That'd be a million bucks back in those days. That's a lot. Seven bulls and seven rams. And go to my servant Job and offer up a burnt offering for yourselves. And my servant Job will pray for you. For I will accept his prayer not to deal with you according to your folly. For you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. So Eliphaz the Temanite and Bildad the Shuhite and Zophar the Naamathite went and did what the Lord had told them. And the Lord accepted Job's prayer. So... That's for the people who are crushed. Also, I want to talk a little bit, and I don't have much time left, but, you know, there's another thing that happens in our walk, and it's the way that the Spirit of God who dwells in us and sees and knows all this stuff about us and about our situation. It's what we call conviction. You know, he will come and he will bring conviction to your heart. Never fear that. It's good. It's health, life-giving. It's healthful. It's not crushing you. It might bruise you. It might cause you to regret some things that you've said and done, but it, he never leaves you desperate without hope. He never leaves you without hope. And he only brings a conviction because that's, that's what has to happen before healing can begin. So we need, to, we need to seek that conviction. That's the repentance that needs not to be repented of that the Apostle Paul talks of, about. Not the world's repentance. That leads to death. That leads to standing on the street corner with a sign. You know? And I'm, I don't mean to just paint every one of them with that brush it could be it could be who knows what we're not in charge of that the thing of it is we're in charge of our hearts with the lord and we don't even know our own hearts like he does we think we do but we don't there's more there's always more and as we walk through this life the process of sanctification the process of making us like Jesus, so that when the day comes and we stand in the divine council before the presence of God, we need not be ashamed. We are covered with his blood. And we, we may not have been perfect, but we've been stumbling along, and we belong to him. You know, which one of your children, who is the brattiest, is not the object of your great love and concern? And solicitude. I was never a brat. <laughs> so, the conviction of sin by the Holy Spirit by which we come to see truth without condemnation. If you would come close to the Lord, prepare to see unpleasant things about yourself that are true. Because a man's spirit will endure sickness, but a crushed spirit who can bear a crushed spirit who can bear Lord bless your word and bless the words that have been spoken for if they bear any resemblance to truth may they find a resting place in all of our hearts in Jesus name Amen